I have not been here for 10 years, but it's my uh, second year and uh, very happy to be back again here on stage. And yes, you might wonder what is behind this uh, title, and you actually just look up go to the left of the corner, then you have the answer to it. So, as you know, this year uh, we passed 1 billion doses sold of Ingovac personal B. So, I will talk a bit about the reasons behind that. And actually, the data you take home from my presentation today is already mentioned by Dr. Murtaugh. So, that is, if you fall asleep during the rest of the presentation, just remember that cross protection is real. So, Ingovac first of all, it's a 20 year old vaccine. And it has provided its role of protection uh, against the economically most important disease throughout the world in uh, 90 different countries in Asia and Europe and North America. We know that first has many different phases. We've already heard about real devastating disease with uh, high mortality rates. And on the other end, uh, we also sometimes only know about the first in a farm because we do diagnostics, uh, either by ELISA or PCR. So there's a lot of various uh, phases of the first. But what we know from density Petri, we'll hear more about that later on, that the cost of first is between 3 and 24 euros per pig. And in 90% of the cases, it's actually higher than 10 euro per baby. So it is a cost of disease. The problem that we're facing in the real world is that the immunity in many cases are too low. And then when we have a virulent pathogen, we see a severe disease. And what we are trying to achieve is a higher immunity and by that being able to uh, reduce the virulence of the pathogen and minimize the exposure. You also heard today from, from presenters that uh, we do not have the perfect tool yet. We do not have the, the perfect first vaccine, but we have something close to that at least. And we also know from the previous presentations that the only solution is not in the model. Uh, Tom Gillespie we mentioned that, that management is a very important part of controlling births. So what is the most important to control births? There could be a lot of different opinions on that. And some would argue that people are actually the most important. So if you're not able to have educated people that know how to manage uh, pigs and demands and Create the right flow of not do uh, stupid things, you're not you're really bad off. And it could also be that uh, the location is more important. So if you have in a high thickness area with a lot of curves, it's impossible to do anything about it. What that means is just that you have to be even better with your biosecurity and your management and pig flow to control curves together with the machine. And Gales, we already heard about that. Uh, in previous presentation as well, we need to protect our hills. Of course, we all want to put naive hills into a naive farm, but in many cases that's not possible. So, the hill procedures are very important in first control. But we all also need a good vaccine. And we know that in our person is, uh, uh, is a very good vaccine, but Probably you also hear some arguments that it's a very old vaccine. It's actually the first vaccine that was launched 22 years ago. Can it really provide protection against the diverse of strains that we see today? And that's what I will try to prove in my presentation. Our basic understanding of the distribution of first uh, in the world, I don't think we would argue about that. In North America, the main uh, first type is type 2, we see some type 1. Uh, both Tom Gillespie and Murtaugh, they show that the dendrogram that they have some type 1. 
They only show it in the Denagon, they don't talk about it, so maybe it doesn't really matter. In Europe, the main type is type 1, actually. And there are also some countries, uh, like Germany, Denmark, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, Hungary, where type 2 is present. And in many cases, we have both type 2 and type 1 in the farm at the same time. And then we have in Eastern Europe, where there are also type 1, but uh, different uh, variations of, of type 2, the type 1. And then Asia with uh, type 2, but here with the hyperthermic first distributed North Asian countries, and then some type 1. And with that, the vaccine of choice everywhere in the world except from Europe would be uh, a vaccine that protects against type 2. So, in my opinion, of course, it's a very personal need. And the strike the right breaker of that vaccine is really amazing. So I'll show you, I'm not sure that the map is complete, but I'll show you what I could find of uh, publications that have been done since the, since the vaccine was launched. So, uh, bear in mind, we have this uh, one million doses sold, and every second we have 3.8 doses of kilobyte person to be sold, and in increasing numbers. From Europe, we had the first peer review publication actually from Denmark in 97. And later on, there were publications from uh, Germany. And we have publications from Hungary and Belgium. And from North America, amazing number of uh, studies. And what you'll see here is that the first publication was in 98. And there was a few publications over the years. But just within the last two years, we have eight publications uh, talking about uh, health wellness protection. There's also uh, publications from Mexico and from Canada. And when you see uh, the list here, so when you see it's uh, with bold, so here this one, and it means that it's peer review publications. The rest of it is uh, Congress abstracts from IPDS or APDS or mercury with diseases. But there's also a lot of uh, publications from uh, Asia, from the Philippines, from Thailand, from Korea, from Vietnam, from China, and also from Japan. An impressive number of publications. And I'm not even sure I have them all here. So that would be most of it. What I did here was I uh, asked Enrique to uh, put in the references where we, from these publications, where we have a sequence available. So th what you see here in this diagram is sequences available from, uh, from these studies put into a global uh, bipolar disease map. So you see we actually have, uh, we have sequences from North America, from Mexico, from Mexico, from Denmark, from China, from Korea, from, uh, from uh, Vietnam, and also from Japan. And you see the quality here. So the barriers, so they are all compared to your person B. And you see the distance here. So they are all between 10 and 50% uh, difference in quality to your person B. And they are all different compared to each other. Some are clustered, so the Chinese isolates here is the hypothetic, the Chinese strains close to the Vietnamese isolates, but we also have some that are very different. And from all of these, I'll look at a close into a few studies. So, a publication from 2013, a recent one from the US, but 174 from 2016, uh, uh, one that has not been published is an R&D study, so you'll be the first one to see the data from that one. Um, and a, a Korean study, so that's what I'll show you now. We've already seen a huge bunch of data from previous presenters this morning, and I'll show you even more data than you have seen until now. But I'll try to put it in the format that it can hopefully make it a bit more exciting. You already saw that, and uh, 
Jeff Gillespie presented this one. So that's the way we normally look at in the US when a new strain or variant appears, they make a, a child study trying to look at the lung lesions and see if a few reference to the is also working against that. And you heard the conclusions from that, so in all the cases, there was a significant difference in lung lesions uh, compared to non-vaccinated uh, in all these child studies. So that's the way we normally look at it. But there's a bunch of other data than this, and we'll have a look at that. So we'll look into the Chinese hypertension first. We'll have a look at the Korean study, uh, kind of celebrating the 20 years of the U.S. Then uh, U.S. 174, and then this uh, Japanese isolates. So actually, uh, the study design in each case here. So this is uh, this is a Japanese uh, R&D study. So you see this is what you'll see now is all uh, laboratory cell studies. So because of that, we don't have hundreds and hundreds of pigs in the studies. But it's very controlled, and we have a huge amount of data from these. In this study, we had three week old piglets, 20 pigs vaccinated with person B, and 20 uh, pigs receiving the placebo. So they were measured weight and blood sample at the day of induced the day of, of vaccination. And then the weekly test with blood samples, weighing again after 28 days when they were challenged, and then at the end with the blood sample after one week and two weeks later they were uh, killed. Uh, so this was a uh, Japanese uh, strain. So what you show from this is very comparable to what we have seen before. So when we look at the lung lesions, there was a significant difference in the pigs that were vaccinated with the white first of the And also the average daily weight gain was significantly lower in the challenge period in the pigs that were vaccinated compared to non-vaccinated. If we look at the Moravia at different sampling points, there was also a difference between the vaccinated and the non-vaccinated pigs. And also, if you look at the Bronca Alala plus fruit at day 42, it was uh, significantly lower. I'll show you a different way of looking at, at data because there's a huge amount of data from the day of challenge and until the study ends. And if you want to show all this data in the curves or in, in, uh, in the PowerPoint, we'll need a huge number of slides that will all be. 82% maybe from one study here. So what you'll see now is a small video that will follow the days from the day of challenge until the end of the study. You have two groups of pigs. So we have a vaccinated group of pigs and a control group. And you see them marked here by small dots. On the y-axis we have the zero bar load. And on the x-axis, we have the live weight in kilogram. Then you can look at the color of these bubbles. They are reflected in the rectal temperature. So if we have a color of blue, there was no fever. It was normal temperature. And when it turns into yellow or even red, the pigs have fever. And the last part is the lung lesions. They are, then we look at the size of the bubble. So we actually have four parameters we follow at the same time, and then the number of days is up here. So now let's start here with the challenge. And you see those groups become very big, but already very fast. Seen that the weight gain is different in the two groups, and also the viral loss is going down in the vaccinated group. So it's not that the vaccinated pig does not come in, become infected after challenge, they become arrhythmic, but they clear the virus faster. And you also see now a very clear difference in the lung lesions. So 
This is what we normally see at the end of the skull. You only see the light weight at the end, and then you see also uh, the viral load at the end of the skull. So the second study, uh, so this is a study from China with a high pathogenic uh, first virus and uh, Murtagh already showed the data uh, from some of the data from that study. Again, the pigs were vaccinated with Ebola first and with B uh, at 28 days of age, with two groups of 22 pigs. And then they were followed by blood samples at the zero. 7, 14, and 21. And then 28 days, they were challenged with the hypergenic first virus. And again, we lost some of the day 32, 35, 42, and 49. And this is the survival curve. So already here, after seven days, the pigs in the control group that were not vaccinated, they start to die. And in the end, more than 60% of pigs in the non-vaccinated group were dead. So very, very severe disease. And also the temperature curve. So initially there was some higher temperature in the vaccinated pigs, but then they come down to normal. Whereas the average temperature in the non-vaccinated group they get, they came up to 41 degrees. But actually, as you know, this is the average, the number of pigs were above 41 degrees, and all the pigs that was above 41 degrees was the one that died later on. The Aurelia curve, so yes, again, after vaccination, uh, pigs became aurelic uh, from the vaccine. They almost uh, cleared the virus until the day of challenge, and then they also became aurelic again after the challenge, but to a lower extent than the non-vaccinated pigs. And here we have the temperature curve. Again, you see very high uh, amounts of virus and temperature at the beginning. Also this one, we look at in a different way. So now we put the data in from the day of challenge and next uh, 14 days. And this time we look at uh, Get two groups here, so the control group and the non-vaccinated, and we have the light weight, the, the, the survival rate, so that the curve you saw before, the survival rate and uh, the x-axis, the light weight and the, the x-axis and the survival rate and the y-axis. Then we can follow the weight and temperature with the color and the number of days, and finally here. We're looking at uh, clinical signs. So this time, the bubble size is not the lung lesions, but the clinical signs, which is behavior, respiratory signs, and also cough. So let's look at the video how it evolves. So we see when already when we had the challenge, there was uh, the, all of the pigs were alive, and you see that the control pigs here they are not moving. More or less at all. And now the survival rate, so after seven days, the first one starts to die. We also see that the vaccinated groups grow a bit slower, bit slower than the strict controls so of the non vaccinated and charged group. So here down to the end of the study, we have only 30% of the pigs alive in the non vaccinated group. So very uh, devastating disease. Another, uh, so now we will look at some other parameters. So before we had uh, bubble sizes for the clinical signs, but this time we have the clinical score on the x-axis, and we have the varemia, the y-axis. You see, after challenge, those groups become varemic. But there's a clear difference between the control and the vaccine group. And look at the clinical score here. So yeah, there was some few clinical signs after the vaccine, the vaccine group as well. But you see the high fever here now by the color, the vaccine group, 
uh, back to normal world season is for but these pigs are really dying and suffering. So at the end of the study here we see that the uh, control pigs, some of them that were left at least, were almost back to normal. You like leaders? That would be more. The Korean study. So in this one, we have four, five different groups. So there was a strict control group, and then there were two backstage groups. The one uh, group was challenged with the uh, Korean leaders one, type two leaders one, and the other one was challenged with the Korean uh, Ligas 5. And we have two non vaccinated groups, again, tapped with either Ligas 1 or Ligas 5. The pigs were 21 days when they were included in the study and vaccinated with the Ligas first on the B. And then there was a group, a strict control group with 10 pigs that didn't receive anything. They were followed again, uh, more or less the same pattern, so Blood sampling every week, and then at day 35, so a bit later, here, we had a challenge with the uh, Korean and Spain, and then uh, followed again with blood sampling 35, 38, 42, 45, and 49 days. And every day there was some monitoring of the clinical signs and also the temperature. This is a bit different to the other studies. In this one, they were measuring also uh, interferon gamma. So this is uh, the level of uh, interferon gamma secreting cells on the x-axis. And we have the different groups here. And then the serum viral load on the y-axis. And now we have four groups. So you see already here in the corner. So we have the strict control groups, there's a small green dot here. We have the two non-vaccinated groups, and we have the, the vaccinated group here. The long lesions, again, this is the size of the bubbles. So you see the groups here now, moving in completely the opposite directions. So the non-vaccinated pig increasing in serum viral loads, whereas the vaccinated pigs increasing levels of interferon gamma and also very low levels of the serum viral loads. And then you see the lung lesions are significantly higher in the non-vaccinated pigs. So I think that's it's very impressive. You see very clearly here. It's not that we can always measure it from gamma so so nicely like here. And the next one I'll show you, the 174 study, there was no difference in from gamma. This is this is a really nice study, but here we really show the difference between the from gamma screen cells mm -hmm. and also the clear difference in the lung lesions. The last study I'll show you it's, uh, was presented this year by uh, Reed Phillips at the Lima Congress. So it's a challenge study. They made again to, to prove the efficacy of Ingolac B against uh, the latest uh, strain isolated in US uh, 174. In this one, there was 159 pigs included. Uh, Several negative at the day uh, the study began. They were 28 days when they were vaccinated with Ingolac B. At the start of the study, uh, there was pigs were weighed, looked for clinical signs, rectal temperature, and blood sampling. And then they were blood sampled and had rectal temperature taken every week until they were challenged with 174 here at 28 days. Then we had blood samples, weight, temperature, and clinical signs. 
And then every day here, God interpreted, no, God was sent by that 29, 31, 25, and 42. Temperature every day. And then the necropsy we had again the weight and temperature and the clinical signs. This is a quite spectacular video, I think. I'll show you what, what it looks like. <coughs> First, we look at the lung lesions. We have a very significant difference here in the lung lesions. Uh, compared to actually very much comparable to what we saw earlier on in the different challenge studies from the US. And also, uh, post challenge everyday awakening was significantly different. So, this study. When you see the video now, we have all the pigs included. So we have the two groups. The non-vaccinated chunks with 174, and we have the vaccinated pigs chunks with 174. And all of the pigs are now, so you see all the dots from each of the individual pigs, how they behave after challenge. We follow the serum bar load on the y-axis, and the lung lesions on the x-axis. And then the clinical score, again, is uh, behavior, uh, respiratory, uh, clinical signs, and cough. It's uh, the size of the bubbles. So now follow the, the, the sizes of the bubbles, because each individual pig will now be shown with its uh, clinical score by the size. So now not only follow the direction, but also how they will. So, you see, all the pigs, the indicate were really quite fast, but some were very also very fast now. You see also some clinical score in the, not in the vaccinated group, that's the blue bubbles, but you see they become smaller quite fast. They don't move that much to the right, so they have less lung lesions. Imagine these are pigs that really feel bad, but then they when they recover them. Small bubbles are good here, lights I think. So in conclusion, first virus is still the most costly disease around the globe. So in 90% of the cases it costs more than 10 euros per pig. In some cases it's much more, the whole value of the pig. Uh, the most predominant uh, type all over the world is type 2, except from Europe. And uh, Ingelberg person will be is the globally preferred first vaccine. I think that it explains why Ingelberg person will be can be so successful after 22 years. And we know that uh, true health as well as protection is a key and it's not linked to genotype. So the dendrogram, no matter how it looks like or how big the distance is, will not tell us how good a protection we can get from a vaccine. We also see that geography is not the key. The geography does not tell us if we can have a good protection. We've shown protection in North America, in Asia, and in Europe. So, all of these countries around the world, we have published uh, results from a good protection uh, from MLS versus B. So, you can be confident that whenever you are and wherever you are, 
They will have a good protection. It's not the only tool. We know that. We already heard from uh, Gillespie that the five-step process is extremely important. The pipe security has to be as good as a second to none. As good as you can is not, probably not good enough. We even have to do beyond that. We have to improve the pig flow and people should be really educated on pig management. Uh, that's crucial. But uh, together with the five-step process and new web person, uh, I think it's a, from the perfect tool and together they have demonstrated the good if you see. So with this, I want to thank the people that helped with this. Reed Phillips, for part of his presentation, he helped me to find all the publications from US. And later, he uh, looked up the sequences and put them into my portal. Xavi has a brain behind these uh, spectacular uh, videos. Carlo Mala helped to get the publications from, uh, from Asia, and Ryan helped to put it into uh, Put it to place with good advice from uh, Oliver Duran and Joe Victoria. He, he, he found all of the sequences that were available in R&D from the various historical studies that we have done over the years. Some of these strains are uh, way back. And then uh, views for the studies with 174 and also a recent uh, Tiamisco study. And with that, I want to 